Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Hokaki's play Antigone Fang. Um, this is the Chinese character for Fang, uh, which means square, uh, as in like Tiananmen Square is maybe the famous example of a Chinese square that uh, English language people would know. Um, this is obviously an Antigone adaptation from the Sophocles. But this might actually be my favorite Antigone adaptation of all of the Antigone adaptations I've read. I'm not a huge fan of Sophocles' Antigone. Um, I, I'm basically sort of in the same general vein as Slavoj Žižek in his version of the play. Uh, I think both Antigone and Creon are wrong. I think their, their ethical perspectives, the way that they view the world, and the way that they insist that their perspective is the right one, I think they're they're both wrong. And so Ho gives us quite a different kind of approach here. Um, this is still set up in the very common 20th and 21st century understanding of Antigone as a conflict between individual liberty and authoritarianism, Antigone representing individual liberty, Creon representing authoritarianism. This is very much a modernized version. And interestingly enough, this is a this is a Canadian play. Um, <clears throat> it was first produced by Young People's Theatre in Toronto in 2019. But in the setting, what it says is, we are in a country not quite like ours, but not quite so different either country where censorship is the norm, state broadcasts are made through speaker phones, rain is seen more than sun, televisions play what we need to see, the news is no news at all, and people disappear when their voices speak a tone too loudly. Now what's interesting about this is that sounds less like Canada and more like Ho's native Hong Kong. So, um, Hokaki is, uh, is from Hong Kong. He was born in Hong Kong, I believe. Um, and then he emigrated to, to Canada and he's currently a Canada based theater artist. Um, he's a, he's a playwright. He's an actor, director. I think he does a number of, of things. This play seems much more to be a response to the pro-democracy protests in Hong Kong. Um, the Tiananmen Square massacre is is reflected here. Um, the People's Republic of China re-education camps, um, which uh, were of course quite prominent during the Cultural Revolution, but even today with the oppression of the Uyghur Muslims. Um, and then the other one I would throw in there is the Black Lives Matter protests, particularly US-based Black Lives Matter protests, which were quite frequently met with repressive police violence. Um, and repressive police violence that was in many cases trumpeted by particularly Republicans in the US government, including President, then President Donald Trump. So this is definitely a modernized contemporary version of Antigone set in the context of um, I would say really the the if you want to boil it down to a single political entity, the People's Republic of China, um, in their treatment of Hong Kong and their treatment of the Uyghur minority, et cetera, et cetera, that's probably your your closest sort of analog for the the setting Ho envisions here. Um, it's an interesting play for a couple of reasons. One is that we don't actually start out where Sophocles' Antigone starts, right? So in Sophocles, we start basically with the battle having already been fought, the Seven Against Thebes campaign in which Ateocles and Polynices kill each other. We start with that, and that is sort of recounted, I think, in the, the prologue. And then the plot itself focuses on Antigone's decision 
to violate Creon's edict. In this context, we start in a re-education center. So the, the prologue, um, the stage directions say, a typical morning at the re-education center, a morning ritual led by Teresia, a series of call and responses with the re-educatees kneeling slash standing slash in a position of supplication with their arms outstretched. They are smiling against their will. And so it is this sort of almost maybe more North Korean kind of kind of thing. Um, Teresia says glory to the Supreme Leader. All of the re-educatees say glory to the Supreme Leader. Teresia says he has led us through a thousand years of sweeping glory. They repeat that. Teresia says may he will it. They repeat that. Um, and this sort of goes on and on. Um, <clears throat> At one point, one of the re-educatees' arms start to, to falter, um, and the guard comes over to, to punish her, and Teresi is like, her arms are tired, but her spirit soars for our leader. What is most That is most important, wouldn't you say? So there is this weird element here where it's like, this is clearly state-imposed coercion, and Teresia introduces us to the first elements of ambivalence in that because um, um, Nikes and Haman, who are both detained in this re-education center, they mount an escape. Um, the plan is basically to go out tell the truth about what is going on in the re-education center, that it is torture, that they are being brutally treated in this place rather than being rehabilitated in any sort of proper functional way. Um, and their, their plan is to lead a revolution, to overthrow the Supreme Leader and this autocratic government in which coercion is required um, this totalitarian government. But what's interesting here is that Teresia makes the argument that she is, in fact, protecting at least some of the people in this re-education center, um, Nike's mother. And the relationships here are different than in Sophocles. Um, Antigone, Ismene, Nike's, and and Teo are all Creon's children. Creon's wife is in the re-education center. Apparently, she like just her mind is is gone. Basically, like she has been psychologically destroyed by what has been done to her in the re-education center. And then Haman is not related to them. So in the Sophocles, Haman is Creon's son. Antigone, Ismene, Polynices, and Ateocles are. Um, Oedipus and Jocasta's children, both of whom are dead by the time the Sophocles begins. Um, so here we have the, the switching up of that, that relationship. Um, so Nike is once his mother released and basically Teresia is like, no, because she can't function outside this place anymore. She is no longer capable of it. Like, she is alive because I am able to keep her alive here. Um, and so there is this weird ambivalence. Like, but, but then Ter Teresia is like, here, go out the back so the guards don't catch you as you're escaping. So it is this, this weird thing where you have these characters who on the one hand represent the repressive authority of an, a totalitarian state, and yet on the other hand are sympathetic to this quest for freedom. Um, so Nikes goes out, Haman go out, um, and they lead a protest in a square. Um, they are demonstrating for freedom, and it is, again, reminiscent of student marches, pro-democracy marches in, in Hong Kong, in Tiananmen Square, in places like this, and Black Lives Matter protests. And Tio, who is... Um, Nike's brother comes, and he is the, the leader of the military side, and they eventually 
kill a bunch of the protesters. <coughs> they arrest a number of the protesters. Um, Nikes and um, Tio kill each other. And then Creon sort of takes charge. He takes charge of the, the sort of mopping up operations. And basically what he ends up declaring is that all of the protesters are not people. They are garbage to be removed from the square with bulldozers. This is not a popular decision, as you might well imagine. Um, but there are also a lot of people in this society who are sort of true believers, and they back this. Now, Antigone and Ismene actually enter this play somewhat late. Like, they're, they don't come in until... Uh, da, 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 da. Until scene two, which is actually about... There's almost 20 pages in. So we have a, a fairly lengthy prologue and a fairly lengthy scene one. And then it's finally with scene two that we get Antigone and Ismene. And one of the things I like about Ho's adaptation is that Ismene is much more prominent and a much more positive figure, a much more effective figure, I would say. This is, I, I really like Ismene. I'm very, very interested in this character. And she just kind of isn't much of a character in Sophocles. She generally isn't treated well or presented well in adaptations um, because the the basic sort of thing is, oh, Antigone is the courageous one who's going out to do what's right, and Ismene is, as Antigone says of her, a sort of meek little coward who's willing to submit to authority. The problem is Antigone's plan is always terrible. Like Antigone specifically consciously does things that she knows will prevent her from succeeding in her stated goal. And we do actually see this in Antigone Fung. Um, Antigone says she is going to go out and um, find Nikes' body to reunite the family. That is her ostensible goal. Um, and she says, because the possibility of seeing our family together is the greatest joy I can imagine. But she also, like Ismene, slightly before this, says, then go quietly, hidden. Don't let them catch you, at least. And Antigone says, oh no, no, not at all. I will shout their names to the heavens let it thunder through the clouds to find them at least. That guarantees you are not going to succeed. If you go out in an authoritarian state and say, hey, I'm breaking the law. Pay attention to me. Look how much I'm breaking the law. You are not going to get what you want. You are not going to have your family reunited. That is the opposite of how you achieve that goal. So, again, this is my, my fundamental problem with Antigone as a character, is that what she says she wants and what she, what she functionally tries to do are completely different things. And that's why I like Ismene, is that she is actually much more practical about things. And Haman in the Sophocles is much more practical about things. Haman, I think, is not generally as criticized, and I suspect that's because Haman has a penis and Ismene doesn't. But I'm getting slightly off of Ho's adaptation. Um, but this is relevant, I promise, because Ismene here is a very, very different type of character than she is in, um, in Sophocles' Antigone. Ismene is much more active here. She is still ambivalent. She still, on some level, believes that what her father tells her, what society tells her, must some, to some degree at least be true. That the supreme leader must be good and wise and have everyone's best interest at heart because 
Again, her father, Creon, who, interestingly enough, Creon is not the supreme leader in this, whereas in the Sophocles, he is king. In this, he is a sort of high-ranking police official um, who is carrying out the will of the supreme leader, who seems to be this sort of shadowy, disembodied figure. Um, but Creon repeatedly says, you must submit, you must obey, both me, Creon, your father, and the supreme leader. Submission to authority is the only ethical position to take. And Antigone does sort of just ignore this. Like, she, she does not, clearly does not buy this. Ismene has a much more ambivalent relationship with this, because on the one hand, this is deeply rooted in, like, Confucian tradition, for instance. So, in East Asia, in China, in Hong Kong, there's a very, very, very long tradition in which submission to authority, submission to one's father, if you're, if you're a child, um, if, you, if your father is still alive, even if you're an adult child, um, submission to the father, that is an ethical imperative. And yet, Confucianism actually does not support authoritarianism. Confucianism is also about the responsibilities of those in the upper portion of social hierarchies toward those below them. One has to act ethically, and it's clear in this instance that Creon is not acting ethically. And so this is one of these tensions and ambivalences around the, the ethical stakes of this play. Creon declares his dead son to be garbage, to be human waste. And that is very anti-Confucian. So again, we've got these tensions that, that, that um, represent this, but then the sort of high water mark, the climax of the play is that Antigone goes out to the square to find Nike's body. Um, she confronts Creon with it, and actually Ismene and Haman. Haman um, had been had sort of fled to their house after pr the protesters were shot. Um, he had been injured, and they, Antigone and Ismene, secretly bandaged his wounds and stuff like this. And then, when Antigone leaves to go find Nike's body, um, Ismene and Haman follow her. To, to find her and try and bring her back. Antigone declares that she is not going to leave Nike's body. And Creon is basically like, all right, then you are no longer my daughter. The bulldozers are going to come in and they will sweep away the, the garbage from the square. And Antigone, in, in this scene that's very much evocative of the Tiananmen Square massacre, the famous image of the guy in front of the tank. Antigone is killed by these bulldozers. And then Ismene basically says, um, Ismene uh, confronts her father. She says, what have you done? And she slaps him. You had a family, a wife, four children, and now now it's just you and me. You ruined us. And not just our family. All these people will never be able to find their dead. Creon says, I did this for our nation, for the supreme leader. This had to be done. Ismene says, everything is a choice, Pa. I will never forgive you. Um, Creon says, don't say that, Ismene. Ismene says, you are entirely alone now, Creon. And so Ismene ultimately is the moral force that brings Creon to his senses because um, Ismene then goes out to find Antigone's body. And basically the next thing that happens is that Creon says, stop, stop the tanks, stop the bulldozers. And so Creon reverses his order. I mean, this is, of course, a, a reworking of the end scene in um, in the Sophocles, where Creon realizes the error of his ways when Haman is dead, his wife has committed suicide, 
and he has lost everyone. But here it is the moral force of Ismaili's argument that ultimately changes his mind. Yes, that required Antigone's self-sacrifice to be effective, but it is ultimately her and not Antigone that changes Creon's mind. And I, just, I think that's a really, really good innovation, a really, really good shift in this play. Because again, I, there is this sort of, I don't, I don't, I don't care for Antigone because this idea that like her self-sacrifice is the ethical choice. I don't think it is. I think the choice to stand up to Creon and to make a moral argument against what he is doing is a more effective approach. And that's one of the things that Ho does in this play, and that's one of the reasons that I really, really like this adaptation.